Hi, this is Michelle Malkin. It is March 20th on the evening of Sunday, the day before a, I believe, a final pre-trial conference at which the Denver DA's office headed by Beth McCann is going to officially and formally drop the second degree murder charges against Matthew Dolloff. I have tonight with me Susan Keltner, who is Lee Keltner's sister, who's been outspoken on behalf of the family in opposing Beth McCann's abandonment of this case. Susan, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. So tell me what's going to happen tomorrow, where you're going to be, and where Colorado citizens can come and help show their support for Lee and for you and your family. Um, we will be at the Lindsay Flanagan Courthouse off of, I believe the address is 520 Colfax, and we'll be standing out in front at about 10 o'clock in the morning throughout most of the day. Court does not start till 1.30, so as many people that we can get to support have signs. You know, we request a peaceful protest because that's just the way we are. We're not violent people. My brother was not violent. So I don't want to go out that way, but I, you know, the more people, the more our voices are going to be heard, the, the more that we can try to change our laws because the way they say and the laws are written is why they're dropping this case. There's so much work to be done. <laughs> and uh, I want you to tell people what exactly is going to happen at this conference and what you'll be able to do and say on behalf of the family. Well, they are formally dropping the charges. I I don't know, but I think I'm going to try in the morning to go in and file an appeal. Um, I was told I could possibly do that, so I was going to look into doing that. Um, I will be reading an impact statement that they the DA told me two weeks ago that I would be able to do in the on behalf of the family and how it's impacted our family personally. So tell me more about who is going to come uh, to the hearing, you as well as who else from your family. I have my oldest son, Austin, and his wife, who are black. I have my other son, Tyler. And I do believe that I know for a fact that I have a few of my brothers uh, or my mother's friends coming as well and then whoever wants to show up from the community whoever wants to support Lee and our family that is highly significant and I just have to thank you for being outspoken and courageous it is sad that in a time of such suffering in this country that you have to essentially fear for your own lives you know the fact that Lee had to sacrifice his own life he was standing up for law and order and peace as you say and um you told uh, richard randall this um last week it's also said that you have to mention the race of the members of your family because in his even in his death he's not here to defend himself lee has constantly been been accused of and smeared as some kind of racist and white supremacist and I want to give you a chance to talk more about that well he never looked at race we grew up in a as a minority in in the midst of Denver and you know and then we both served in the service where if you go in the service you got every race in there and they're they're your family you don't you don't say oh i'm not going to protect this or i wouldn't die for this person oh i'm sorry you're black it doesn't work that way we were born and raised to love people and love people for who they are you know yes it just so happens to have a black family that people are clueless that he even has that so yeah. you know i just, i i don't know i just i'm dumbfounded on this whole thing and I'm shocked. I'm in disbelief that this is actually happening. I can't believe that they call me in. I go in by myself and to be prepare myself for 
to be completely blindsided saying they're dropping all charges. I'm exhausted. I'm, my brain is trying to wreck my brain on what I can do and what I, what I need to do to go further to help my family. I can and stand up for my family. I can hear it in your voice. I can't even imagine the, the toll that it's taking. And I did get to exchange messages with your mom who said she's devastated and they can't be here. Like I said, you have to, to worry about your own safety and security now. I, I don't think that uh, anybody who supports law and order, who went to back the blue back in July 2020 and of course in October 2020 can feel safe knowing that the leadership in the Denver Police Department had previously ordered stand downs that allowed violence to occur in the first place um and it is open season and uh you know when Tig Tigan was on the radio um in the immediate aftermath after this announcement that's that's the message that he said that the denver da's office has sent and racking your brain about what to do now i mean we're supposed to have prosecutors who are supposed to guarantee equal justice under the law and that clearly hasn't been the case in 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 what's happened to your brother um have you talked to legal experts or others about what kind of recourse there can be other than appealing is there is there civil action that could be taken i'm pretty sure there could be civil action unlawful death i just don't have the funds right now to obtain a lawyer um that but that is our next step well, I, I'm hoping that there will be a good turnout tomorrow and that people will be able to hear your victim impact statement. Um, if you could send that to me, I'd love to be able to publish it and share it online wherever I can as well. And hopefully there is a lawyer out there who will hear more about this case and find a creative and proactive means of fighting back against this Denver DA. I mean, I think that there are things that really should be done by the Republican Party and Republican legislators and anybody who considers themselves uh, a, a, an advocate of self-defense um, right. and a freedom of speech and a, a freedom of association. Um, can you talk more about the media? Because I know that you were reluctant, you know, for a long time to talk to any media. So I really appreciate that you're talking um, to me tonight. The and and you have good reason to to be skeptical and you know to be very wary and cautious. Tell me more about how Nine News and others have treated you, and of course the the role that they played on the day that Lee Keltner was assassinated. And that is the word I will use from now until the end of the earth. Right. Um, so at the beginning, I was hesitant just because we're still in shock. We're still trying to grieve. I mean, we had an abundance amount of media um, wanting reporters, you know, the Gazette, the New York Times. I mean, all these people wanting to speak in out of the respect for my family I chose not to speak you know I thought okay we'll get our day in court this will be fine well now that we're getting that taken away from us I feel that we need to speak out we need to be heard um I've had um the first reporter that reached out to me was from a nine news media um, after we were told that there was not going to be any charges brought, you know, I know that I, you know, I spoke with Stefan and I, and I feel comfortable with you and him. Mm -hmm. And I know they shared that with Fox news. Um, they, we believe, and I don't know how much I should get into this, but we believe that nine news reporter helped this antagonizer to get a story and I believe that they didn't expect this story but I think they were working with the antagonizer uh, Jeremiah Elliott 
So that's my stance on that. Yeah. And I had done a couple of columns and had tweeted out a lot of the grassroots citizen journalist video that came out on that day in live time, real time. And then afterwards, that seemed to suggest exactly what you're saying. And, you know, I that is my opinion. And it is backed up by a lot of video. And unfortunately, the way that the Denver DA has handled this case, there will be no discovery. There will be no opportunity to get at the messages, the phone calls, the texts, the emails that might have occurred before, during, and after between and among these different characters. So the Nine News producer was Zach Newman. Uh, then there was Jeremiah Elliott and Matthew Doloff. At one point, the Denver City Attorney's Office had released a supplemental statement. I don't, I don't know if you've seen this. I know, I know we haven't talked about it yet, but I did tweet it out in which they raised the possibility, for example, that Nine News might be liable for having contracted with a fraudulent, illegal, unlicensed security guard who was milling around and um, sort of trailing Lee as Jeremiah Elliott was instigating at the very tail end of the protest. Correct. And I saw all those videos as well. Right. And a lot of spectators seeing that as well that were not questioned by the DA. Yes, yes. So, I mean, that's just one aspect of it. There's so much in discovery that would have shed light on all of these still unanswered questions that the Denver DA doesn't want anybody to pursue anymore. But I think that there are other means by which that information could be obtained or at least, or at least, you know, we can't give up on on raising the alarm about it. And there are, as Stephen Wright pointed out, lots of halo videos that are mm -hmm. sitting somewhere with a lot of information and video coverage that certain people don't want to be seen, right? Right. Um, I know one of these last text messages went to a mutual friend. And I went into a D the DA meeting, gave him all of his information, and still nothing. They never questioned him, never called him. Um, my nephew has asked them to call him. The DA's office also refused and has not called him. The only time they've reached out to him in the last 17 months is two weeks ago when they told him that they called him and told him that they were dropping the case. That's flabbergasting. And just for listeners who haven't followed every last detail, the, the nephew you're talking about is Lee's son, who was right there in the thick of things. And so for the Denver DA to try to, to pass off um, its so-called investigation as a thorough investigation, because in the statement they sent me, they said, oh, well, we interviewed dozens of, of people. Well, which people did they interview? And just because they interviewed a couple of cocks does not make that a thorough interview. If they didn't interview the immediate family uh, uh, of Lee, his own son who was right there, how can they possibly say that it's case closed? Right. I know they took CJ down to the uh, this police station, but and, and they have his cell phone in evidence. CJ tells me that there is video of them coming up on them at that stoplight and, in the, and antagonizing them and coming up to them. They were trying to leave. They were trying to walk away. They mm -hmm. didn't, you know, how is Lee being the aggressor when they're approaching them? They, have they a, were leaving. They have his cell phone still in possession? Is that right, Susan? They still have Lee's original cell phone, and they also have my nephew's original cell phone as well. Are you going to get it back? How does that work? I have no idea. Um, I would imagine that my sister-in-law would get it. Mm -hmm. 
but we're not speaking, so I don't know. Mm. I do want to make sure they hold on to evidence for the civil suit before they destroy it. Absolutely. Absolutely. That sounds like key video. Um, and there's a lot of other citizen video. Some of it has disappeared because mysteriously, or maybe not so mysteriously, Twitter has suspended the accounts of many of the citizens who were there that day who posted video, which you cannot now access anymore. Um, Richard Randall has a lot of video. The, uh-huh. the screen cap that I took that I had spread, um, maybe it was the day after, that shows Zach Newman and Matthew Dolloff off to the side on, on the right of the screen while Jeremiah Elliott is doing his, you know, full crazy theatrical performance with Lee and Stephen Wright there. Um, he has that video. I don't think Richard was ever questioned by the police either. So either there's, I mean, there's, there's two things that are going on. There's a lot of video that they're sitting on that they don't want to come out. There's a lot of video that did come out that somehow has mysteriously been rabbit holed as, as well. It just stinks to high heaven, doesn't it? It doesn't seem um, fair. No, it's not fair. A point blank, visibly seen murder caught on so much camera. How is that case dropped? And I don't care if Lee slapped him. That doesn't constitute a a bullet between the eyes. Yes, And that's one thing else I wanted to bring up, too, because if you read the email exchanges that I had with the communications director, the narrative they're going on with now is to unequivocally blame the victim and say without any context that Lee was the one who was violent. Lee was the one who um, who was the instigator rather than the other way around and to completely whitewash the role that Jeremiah Elliott played and why they were doing this because the entire event was peaceful. And so nine news and the rest of the liberal media, the Denver post included, cause that photographer, as you know, Alan Richardson was there taking lots and lots and lots of pictures towards the end only at the end when they were expecting something to happen. That's my opinion about it. That's what I saw. It would have been great for a jury of one's peers to be able to see all of that as well and make their own determination rather than have Beth McCann just shut the door to it all. Of course they're not seeing the soup cans being thrown at the Patriots or anything that else happened that, that evening. Yeah, that's a really good point. And uh, I have a friend, Andy No, who is a fellow journalist who wrote an entire book about Antifa's tactics and how they manufacture these narratives. And so the whole day before, there were local Antifa in the Denver area and Colorado Springs as well, who were saying that this was uh, like a peaceful, charitable, soup can collection things thing. At the same time, that many Antifa locally, as well as across the country, have hurled the same soup type cans at police and truly peaceful ralliers like Lee and others. That's what they were doing. Right. Um, did Did you see some of the video as well? And of course, I think Helen Richardson and Matthew Dolliff and Nine News were also recording it. Instead of recording the peaceful peaceful rally they were on the margins like on the outer areas where all the instigators were jeremiah elliott wasn't the only one they were setting fires to the american flag and doing all sorts of other there of their you know violent leftist um not so peaceful protest as well absolutely disgusting (sighs) and so to try and get the truth out about this has been really difficult um you know we sort of kind of we're joking a little bit about this on Facebook, you can't share like, you know, one of the main sites that um, posts my column that had my column and all of the embedded links on it on Facebook because it goes against community standards. Whatever that means. 
Right. Who standards? Who standards? standards. Yeah, exactly. Who standards and whose community? Um, so afterwards, will people on Monday, tomorrow, will people be able to join you because you're going to go to the, you know, the site where Lee was killed and are you going to, to do something there? I, I would like after court, if we could all go up there. I've, I have not been there since oh. it happened. Okay. So I'd like to be able to go up there for my family, my, with my boys and, and try to respect my brother that way. I think a, a moment of silence and I would like to be there, um, with you. And I know there are others who would like to join you too, and just have a marker and, um, a moment. And I think that that would be, I think anything that we can do to just try to prick the consciences of the people in power who are supposed to guarantee justice and let them know, I mean, who knows? I mean, I don't know how many people will come. I know it's Monday morning and, and it's hard for people and, and it's hard for you. I mean, you told me you have two jobs and, and a young daughter and yet, you know, you're finding the time and the energy to do this because it's important. Right. I, I mean, I've had to, the last 17 months, base everything around court and COVID. <laughs> right. Right. And those two things have bollocked each other up as well. You know, my parents aren't in the best of shape and they're in Arkansas. Um, and, you know, his, Lee's one son is, you know, still young, trying to find his way in life and dealing with the loss of his, his father. So, you know, try and step in as much as I can or as much as he'll let me, you know, so I've been pretty busy. And it is. And I'm expecting another grandchild. I've already got one and I'm getting another one. So oh my goodness. Life's a little crazy. <laughs> it is. It is crazy. And you're handling it. You still have it. to go on day by day. I can't stop because. I don't know what I would do if I stopped right now. I, I've, I'm really on a, on a mission, and I, I want to get some form of justice for my family. Yeah. There's boys and my boys who love their father, their, their father and uncle, uncle. Mm-hmm. deserve that. So we haven't gotten to talk about um, sort of Lee's background and what you miss most about him. Uh and I, I wanted to give you an opportunity to right so many of the wrongs and the errors and the smears about who your brother really was. Well, he was a father, a brother, a son, a grandfather, an uncle. He was uh, a Navy veteran, um, a Colorado native. Um, we have a long line history of patriotism in our family between many military, um, between the army and the Navy. Um, we've had, my grandfather was a Denver fire chief. So, you know, Denver's our home and, you know, he, he believed in standing up for what he believed in. Um, he was an ordained minister. Um, he's, there's actually going to be a couple of there tomorrow that he had married Hmm. that I know is coming. Wow. Um, he was a hat maker and he started that, I want to say about 25 years ago. And at one point he had three booths at the Western stock show. Um, he had a hat business at the Grizzly Rose and he made custom hats. I mean, we're talking beautiful hundred percent beaver hats that were just incredible. He hand sewed everything, just very intricate and very precise. And he, he made sure that customer felt special and knew that that hat was one of a kind and was just for them. So, um, there is an article and I want to, I can't remember if it was Denver post or one of the radio stations years ago that did a interview with him. And the video is just, unreal it's it's so nice to hear his voice and to hear his passion for what he did he was great at that and he um he was a biker he almost died a year and a half ago before he died oh my gosh um, 
in a really bad accident off of I-70. Ugh. And we got him and his wife got flight for life to the hospital, and both of their heads were wide open. Oh, gosh. But, uh, you know, and then, of course, got sick from the medication from that, went to kidney failure, and literally I tell everybody now that a bullet took him down because I don't think anything else could have taken him down. Wow. But, yeah, he was he, – he had a big passion for motorcycles. Not only did he do hats, but he also sewed leather. So that's where he got into working for Harley and sewing, um, like, the bags off the motorcycles. And mm -hmm. he was just really talented with his hands and really enjoyed it. And I also remember when he was younger, um, younger adult age, he would travel around and do Western reenactments with, like, Buffalo Bill and all that kind of stuff. Oh, neat. He really had – I have a lot of pictures I could send you that are – he's got a lot of different, you know – we go get family pictures and I say, well, what kind of Halloween costume are we wearing today, Lee? You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely send me some of those. That sounds wonderful. Just, he was very, he was very um, interesting and in whatever he dressed up in. A lot of different intricate type jewelry. And, you know, they talk about all his rings and stuff. But I think most of those rings were my biological father's rings mm -hmm. that were um, he wear. But uh, he wore hats all the time, whether it was a leather or a cowboy hat. Sometimes a bell cap. Mm -hmm. But, you know. But One of the problems is that when you have a predominantly leftist liberal media, anybody who strays from their part of the spectrum, they don't understand, they refuse to understand, and they turn them into these like evil cartoon characters and there's nothing Not right yeah totally dehumanizing and demonizing and unfortunately i've had experience with nine news with that and in july 2020 when we had that back the blue rally at civic center plaza it was kyle clark you know one of their lead anchor personalities who laughed at the fact that people were attacked on the stage and mocked us and didn't do anything to ensure any kind of fair and balanced coverage. These people say they try to understand all perspectives. And from everything that you've told me, everything that I've seen online, and I saw that wonderful segment on um, Lee's hat making and, it, and that beautiful studio that he was in, he was a craftsman, he was creative, and he had passions for this country and the country that he served and that you served, and for the West and for Colorado. And to turn all of that and to turn his passion for motorcycles and biking into some sort of excuse for smearing him and associating him with bad people racism. and racism and white supremacy when there's video of that black lives matter aligned jeremiah elliott gloating after lee was murdered i can't it's disgusting and i and i wouldn't blame any decent law-abiding coloradan for never trusting or never wanting to talk to any media it just sickens me and i just I can't apologize on behalf of, of these people in my business, but I wish I could, Susan, because I can't. Right. It's, a, it's like it is an embarrassment and a humil humiliation to what should be a proud profession that stands up for, you know, the, the people who don't have a voice. It's, a, it's horrible. I'm sorry. Right. I'm so sorry. The DA is making it not a big issue that Matthew Doloff has an Antifa tattoo on his wrist either. They said it doesn't matter. That is a really good point. And again, for a lot of the folks out there who haven't followed this carefully, can you talk a little bit more about what you found out or what you've read about about this guy's uh, advocacy for left-wing um, <laughs> violent uh, organizations like Antifa? When he... <coughs> Excuse me. When he was arrested, his hands were up in the air, and you can visually see a tattoo on his wrist. Mm -hmm. 
which is a space of Mater symbol, Mm -hmm. which is an Antifa symbol. When I asked the DA's office, does that matter? They told me, no, it's not even going to be a big deal. They're not going to bring it up. Just like they didn't want to bring up the fact that he was reaching in his vest for my brother's gun. They didn't want to bring that in because then it would show that he knew that he had a gun and that he was he had reason to believe <coughs> that he uh, reason for him to feel afraid. Right. Right. They, they, they can't have that. So yeah, talk more about that because, you know, one of the things also that, um, the Stephen Wright said in a statement that he released last week and that he also sent to the DA is that there's, there's 12 seconds of missing video that nine news producer, Zach Newman mysteriously decided to stop recording and then picked up the recording afterwards. And, um, you know, there may be video out there. They may be sitting on it of exactly what you're describing of that grabbing, what exactly he was grabbing in Lee's vest. Well, there's a still picture of Lee slapping Dola. Right. And in that picture, his hand is in his vest right where his holster is. Right. I mean, they're acting like that that didn't happen, and I... It's like it's visually, why would his hand, first of all, why would Lee slap him if he wasn't doing anything to him in the first place? So when Lee went and told him to get the effing camera out of his face, Doloff reached into Lee's gun. Lee felt it, open-handed slapped him, didn't slug him, he open-hand slapped him. And then Lee backed up 12 to 15 feet, Doloff pulled his gun out pointed at Lee's face and I've been in the DA's office and listened to frame by frame mm-hmm. and the you hear the pop of the mace and the go, gun go off instantaneously yeah. You know? yeah so the gun was already at Lee's face when he popped the mace so he was he was self defending himself yes And now, as things stand, a jury will never get to hear that, will never get to hear what you heard and decide for themselves who really should have been protected by self-defense and who should be prosecuted for murder. You know, it shouldn't be politics. It, It doesn't matter what spectrum you're looking at. You look at the evidence and you see it. You see that the gun was pointing at his face and everybody is asked the same question. How is this happening? How is he getting off of murder? When it's visually murder, it's not self-defense. Yeah. 17 months, you were working within the system. I mean, how many, how many hearings or meetings or... Uh, interactions did you have in that 17 months with the DA, um, you know, leading you to believe that this thing was going to go to trial? I mean, this thing was headed to trial in just a couple of weeks. Is that right? Um, April 12th yep. was supposed to be trial. I would imagine, I think we've had one to two meetings, um, court cases a month yeah. in those 17 months. And no indication right up until the moment that they told you that they were dropping it, did you have any sort of feeling or doubt at all that, that, that this was going to happen or was it totally out of the blue? I would have never expected this to happen. Yeah. The only thing that I ever really worried about was finding a open jury to listening to all facts, Mm -hmm. not be so liberal and to jump into conclusions. Right. Right. So you had just, you know, kind of trusted all along that this would actually get to a jury and then bam. Right. We believe there was going to get to a jury. Yeah. I would have never, never in my mind would have doubted that they would drop all charges. Yeah. Well, take that back. The only thing they charged him with was second degree murder. murder. They never charged him with anything else but that. Yeah, that's a good point, too. 
nothing about being a security guard without a license. No unlawful gun, nothing. Right. You know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, you're absolutely right, Susan. This shouldn't be about politics, but now it's poisoned everything. And, you know, sort of the thing that's glaring right in our faces is that this is a decision that was made precisely because we're headed into this big political campaign season. And a Denver DA who describes herself as the so-called progressive prosecutor did not want to yield control to a jury that might come to a different determination than, than what they wanted to come out of it. Is that how you right. feel? Right. Yeah. So, um, I will send you my statement for tomorrow. Okay. And you will see what I've put in about the Denver DA. Okay. Great. And I will make sure that everybody hears that and sees that. So is the, is the hearing itself public or no? I don't know. Okay. All right. Um, and then you don't know, do you know if media is going to show up and be allowed to be at the hearing? Cause you know, what good is it if you make a victim in- impact statement and like people can't see, see you and, and hear your voice when you deliver it, you know? Right. Well, you know, I know that somebody from the Gazette has been there mm-hmm. and wrote that my brother was heavily armed with knives that he didn't carry, not one. So I know and in the past there's been a reporter there. Um, honestly, if it was up to me, everybody that goes tomorrow, I think, should be standing up for me. And I don't care if it's standing room only. Go in there and support me. And I don't care if they're there or not. Okay, good. So, well, we'll get the word out about that for sure. And the address again, where you're going to be at, 10 o'clock, did you say? 10 o'clock, 520 Colfax. It's the Lindsay Flanagan Courthouse. Okay. 